Hi there everyone, welcome back to Dandelion Delphi Tutorials. Today we're going to have a look at creating our own functions. These are called user-defined functions and this will be needed from grade 10 to grade 12. Let's just have a look at some terminology. We are going to create our own functions, but I am showing you here examples of functions that you've already used. Let's say I wanted to create the function length that determines the length of a string. I'm going to go into private, type in function, space, and then give my function a name. This name would have to be unique and it cannot be a reserved word. So I would not be able to create this function here. This is just to explain it to you. If I wanted to create my own length function, I would have to change the name of the function because length is a reserved word in Delphi. This is called the signature where I'm declaring this function. And functions can have what we call parameters, or it can have no parameters, or it can have many parameters. But here's just some examples of one parameter each. So I am going to declare my parameters inside of these round brackets, starting with P, to help me understand that this is my parameter. You can assume now when you are coding your function that P string has a value and that would be the value that the user entered when we called this statement that we'll get to just now. This parameter needs a data type. So this P string has a string data type. And very important is that functions always return an answer that we call the result. And that result has a data type, and that is what we put here at the end. If you think about the length function, the result of the length function is an integer number. And for that reason, I am putting integer here at the end. Let's have a look at the trunk function. So I'm going to send it a real number, but remember trunk returns an integer number for me. So that is why I have an integer data type as the result. We can also have functions with a boolean result data type. For example, the odd function where we send it an integer number and we return a true or a false depending on whether it is odd or not. Now, a function needs to have a call statement. And that is you guys have coded this part here up to now. So this is not going to change. I am still going to have a call statement where the result of that function is stored in some variable. This here, for example, the length is just going to be now your own function that you have created. So if we have a look at the call statement of an, the length function, we sent it an argument. And this argument had to be string. And the input for the user had to be done above this statement. So we would have S input signed to the edit box or maybe an input box. And then we use that variable in the call statement of the length function, sending the input of the user that it was stored in S input to the parameter of the function P string. So when this function runs, P string will have the same value as what the user entered in my call statement. And the length function had to be assigned to an integer value because the result of the length function was integer. It's very important that your call statements always form part of another statement. We often use them in assignment statements like this, or we could even put them in output. But a function like, for example, the odd function that returns a true or a false can also be used in an if statement. I could also use the length function in an if statement to say, if the length of the input is not equal to 13, then do x, y, and z. When we are creating our own functions, for grade 10 and 11, we're always going to put them under the private declaration of your unit. And you're going to start with function and then the unique name. This name also needs to follow the same rules as your declaration of variables. And then we're going to declare our parameters. So here is declaring the my own odd function. Send, and it's going to have a parameter of an integer data type. And it's going to return a Boolean 
result. Remember to add the semicolon at the end, else the next step won't work. Once you have done that declaration, you are going to push Control Shift C. They are all going to be pushed together. So start with Control, then Shift, and then C. And if your declaration was correct, the skeleton code will open up. That is similar to when you are double clicking on a button. That would also be the skeleton code of that button. So you will have the function heading and a begin and an end, and you are going to complete the bit in between. We're going to code as usual inside of our function, but very important is your function is not going to make use of any objects on your form. So you're not going to see an input box or an edit box or a rich edit or a label inside of my function. The way that it will get values is through its parameters when this statement is called. So pnum will now have a value, let's say it was 10, and if 10 mod 2 is equal to 1, then my result is going to be true. That means it is a odd number. But if 10 mod 2 does not equal to 1, then my result will be false. Very important that your function has a result. You will see that result has not been declared, but you will be able to use it. The result has to match the data type of my function. So in this example, the function's result is Boolean. Therefore, I have to assign a Boolean value to the result. So either true or false. The result is the answer that your function will return when you call this function. If I run my program now, it will sort out some syntax errors. But if my function, my own odd, has not been called yet, therefore I will not see any output regarding this function. So the next step is to call this function in your button where you need to use it. And here is an example of calling this function. This would typically be in a menu or in a button. And I have a local variable here stored as an integer or declared as an integer. Then I get input from my edit box for the number that the person entered and now I'm going to call my function called my own odd. Remember now my own odd had a parameter of integer data type. So now when you're calling your my own odd function you have to send it an integer argument as we did before when we called built-in functions. And my own odd is going to either return a true or a false. So if I say, if my own odd, sending it i num as an argument is equal to true, then I can display in my caption odd. If this my own odd function returns a false, in my label I'm going to store or display even. I am now able to use my own odd everywhere in my program, wherever I need to find whether a number is odd or even. And I've written only one set of code that can be used multiple times, and that is one of the advantages of a function. If you are using my book in class, there are three activities that you can use to practice functions with. I am now going to show you guys the maths activity. If you haven't done so already, go and download the grade 10 data files from this link. Open the program Maths and then try to complete this function. We always start by creating our functions because we can't call the function until it has been created. The words receive, or receives in this case, indicates the parameters that your function should have. So if you have a look at this question, you will see that it needs two integer parameters. The word return or result indicates the data type or the answer of what this function is returning. And here you can see it is returning a message whether it was correct or incorrect. So this function will need a string data type. Now press pause, try it yourself, and I'll show you the memo of this function. Here is the signature of my check answer function. As the question said, I need two parameters. One is the user's answers, and the other one is the correct answers, both as integer values. 
and the return data type of this is going to be string since it's returning correct or incorrect and you have a semicolon there at the end then push Control shift c and it will open up for you the skeleton code inside of my function i will now have an if statement to test if the answer by the user which is p user is the same as the correct answer you will see that these are my two parameters that i have received and you may assume when you are coding your function that they will have values they will only get values once you have the call statement but for now assume that they will have values and if the answer was correct my return result would be correct well done result would be a string because this function has a string return data type i will also be counting the number of correct answers i correct is a global variable and since i'm using it in ink i will have to still initialize it in form on activate that i'll show you just now if the answer was not correct i'm going to return the labeling the correct answer is and i'm going to put p answer which is the correct answer in my result here at the bottom you will see i correct was initialized to zero in form on activate and it was also declared as a global variable at the top of my program i'd now like you to try the button ask and do the following the first bullet here indicates that we have to do some validation then you have to pick a random number from 1 to 12, storing them as i big and i small. But you want to swap the contents of this ver these variables to ensure that the biggest value is stored in i big and the smaller one is in i small. If the user selected a divide, I want you to change i big to be i big times by i small. This is just to ensure that we always have integer answers and where it says make use of a dialog box that really means make use of an input box and use i big and i small inside of the input box so that they can see what the question is i want you to always use i big first and then the smaller one second do this part press pause i'm going to show you the rest of the question just now you are asked here to count the number of questions that have been asked so far and then call your function check answer to display the result of that function in your label. The first part of the question asked us to do validation to check if the person selected something from the radio group RGP choose. So I will use an if statement to test if the item index is less than zero. So the item index is actually equal to negative one if the person has not selected any option from this radio group. And then I'm going to display a message and I'm going to exit that procedure. Remember that begin and end. Then I have to store two random numbers, numbers from one to 12, and I'm using my random range one comma 13. Remember the second argument is excluded with our random function. We are then asked to ensure that the biggest number is stored in i big and the smaller number in i small. So if i big is smaller than i small, I need to swap the values of these variables. Now to swap values, you need to have a keeper. Imagine you had two glasses of water, one with red water and one with blue water, and you wanted to swap over the contents of those two waters or glasses of water. You would not be able to do it unless you have a third glass and that is i keep that's my third glass to keep the biggest value then replace the biggest value by the smaller one and then give the smaller one the value that you kept which was my original biggest value remember to put this in your begin and end because you only want to swap this around if the bigger value was stored in i small instead of in i big since the answer depends on the operator that the person tested from my radio group, the item index of my radio group will be a perfect place to make use of a case statement. If they clicked on the first option, that should be the correct answer is taking the biggest one plus the smallest one and storing it as I ons. For deducting the two numbers from each other, I am just going to deduct the two and they are multiplying the two with each other. 
The last option here is when we are dividing. And what I've asked you to do, let's just take the example. Let's say the bigger number that was picked was 5. I am make, changing the biggest number now to 5 times 3, which is 15. So that when I am going to display here in my input box, I'm going to say 15 divided by 3, and my answer would be 5. So your case statement here is really helping you to find the correct answer and storing it in IANS, which is needed when we call the check answer function. You will also ask to count the number of answers, so that would be ink I count. And remember to initialize I count in form and activate, and then also declare it as a global variable. On the radio group, we only had a single symbol plus, minus, divide, or multiply and divide. I just wanted to show you guys how to store input from uh, the items of a radio group, but storing it as a char data type. So I have C operator here declared as a char data type. I will still use radio group item square bracket radio group dot item index, but to copy out just one character, I am going to put the square brackets one at the end, and that will allow me to store the input as a char data type. Now I need to ask the user the question and store their answer. So in my input box, I am going to just put answer at the top of my input box, and here is my question. So start with your biggest value into string it, plus my operator that I stored just now from my radio group, so plus, minus, or divide, and then adding then my smallest number. Now I need to call my check answer function to display the result of the answer in my labels caption property. So I'm just going to assign it to check answer. Remember the result of check answer is a string. So I can just assign it to the caption of my label. What is very important when we are calling our functions is that our arguments that we are sending this function match the parameters of that function in NOD, number, order, and data type. This here was the declaration of my function. My, if you have a look at the check answer function, there were two parameters, that's number. So therefore, where I call my function, I have to send it to arguments. The next was the order, and it was very important in this question to get your order right, but it's always important to get the order correct. And we needed the user's answer first, so that's our user that I stored here from the input box, and then the correct answer second, and that was I answer that I gave a value to in my case statement. And then finally, we get to the D that stands for data type. Since my function was declared with two integer data type parameters, my arguments also need to be integer. Both of them were integer, so my arguments will be integer because my parameters were integer. Now you can test and run your program and see if you can get the right answers. Thank you for watching Dandelion Delphi tutorials. You can continue with these activities in Dandelion Delphi Book 1. Please feel free to share this video and also leave some comments if there's anything else that you would like me to explain. Hope to see you soon!